What I'm going to be doing today is saying a little bit about the stem cells that we find in our own bodies, so-called adult stem cells. This is a picture of a, a sea anemone. Um, not everybody knows that, as far as we're aware, sea anemones live forever, observed to live, and in fact they lived in this aquarium in Edinburgh um, until someone turned off the taps and they all died, but they lived for 80 years. Um, presumably they would have lived a lot longer if people hadn't been quite so careless. So partly stem cells is about renewal, it's about a degree of immortality. Um, they're the most proliferative and um, potent cells in our bodies in a way. This is the, this is the cell division cycle. Um, this is the, it, the sort of interphase period, DNA synthesis, a second period of interphase, and then mitosis. And this is a cycle which all cells undergo when they divide. And what marks out stem cells is they're dividing cells that can self-renew, that is, they can make more of themselves. So if this is a stem cell, this daughter cell could also be another stem cell. Um, or they can, they can produce other cells. So when this stem cell divides, this stem cell might actually begin on a path of differentiation to become a more specialized cell type. So what marks out stem cells in their essence is this ability to divide to produce other stem cells, which can then obviously again divide, and also the ability to divide to produce a cell which is going to do some sort of biological function in the body. Um, I'm going to start by introducing Colin Yehoda. Colin Yehoda is a co-director of Nesky. He works in Durham, and I thought since you were seeing me, you should see him too. But I'm really going to be talking about Colin's work. Colin works on stem cells that are found in hair follicles. So this is the hair follicle, this is the base, this is the, the hair shaft, and this is the so-called bulge. And you can find stem cells in hair follicles. I'm going to show you some of the properties that Colin's been able to show that these stem cells have. So he's shown, for example, that if you take these, these dermal um, hair follicles, um, the stem cells there will, will actually be recruited to sites of injury in the skin. So if the injury is, is in hairy skin, then some of these stem cells will leave the hair follicle and they'll move into the area of wound healing, and that's what's shown here on the left. Um, you can actually take hair follicle cells and you can make new skin, completely new skin. Colin has done this. And this is skin that contains both the, the, the dermis and the epidermis. So it contains the epidermal layer, which is the top of the skin, and it also contains the dermal layer, which also has things like sweat glands and hair follicles themselves. So from, from a cell type um, in the hair follicle, or two cell types, in fact, you can create the whole of um, the organ, the skin. And this is what it looks like in schematic detail. We have these bulge stem cells that produce the epidermal, basal layer cells that then produce the epidermis, and we have the basal cells that produce the, the dermal elements of the skin, the sweat glands and the hair follicles. Um, and in a way, it is as simple as that. There are these two cell populations which through this opportunity of renewal, but also differentiation, can replace damaged or lost skin, or indeed can be used to generate skin, as it were, de novo, from these cells. Um, Colin was also able to show, with the help of his wife, um, that he could take um, his own stem cells from his hair follicle and he could implant them in his wife's arm and his wife could then grow one of his hairs. So it's a slightly uh, interesting experiment. Um, and it shows two things, really. One, that from those cells you can get a complete hair follicle because that's a proper hair follicle growing a hair. But it also says there's something special about these stem cells because there was no tissue rejection. Colin and his wife are, are clearly um, not histocompatible. It would be very rare if they were. Um, but nonetheless, there's no inflammation surrounding that transplant. And this immunoprivilege, this way in which the immune system seems to handle stem cells in a different way than it does other cells, is one of their key advantages, I think, particularly for transplantation. Okay, and Colin was also able to show um, that you can make all sorts of different um, tissues using these cells. So you can make fat, um, you can actually make nerves, you can make bone, um, and you can make blood vessels. So this is another element of, of, of stem cells 
that they can actually make cells that they wouldn't normally make in the body. They normally can't make every cell type, they can make a subset of cell types, and that's why they're called multipotent and not pluripotent. Most adult stem cells are multipotent. They can, I mean, a, a skin cell, a hair follicle cell, would never usually make bone. But some of you who remember your development of biology will recognize that this is a particular developmental lineage that these cells belong to, and they can therefore uh, differentiate into these different cell types. And of course, for the purposes of replacement, being able to make new tissue is really very important. Okay. Um, this is another experiment that Colin did, and I think Colin's work really very well illustrates the, the potential of stem cells. This is done in mice, it's not, it's not done in people. But obviously you can, you can irradiate a mouse, you can destroy all the bone marrow. Um, and as an aside, it was actually the radiation damage um, at Hiroshima that led people to understand that stem cells might exist in the body and the bone marrow. That's how they were first discovered. I may come back to that by people called Till and McCullough. Um, so this poor mouse is destined to die, no immune system. They get a dermal stem cell injection and you can rescue that phenotype. So you can repopulate their bone marrow with you know, the myeloid and the um, hematopoietic lineages simply using uh, these stem cells from hair follicles, which I find remarkable. Okay, and this is a summary then. Um, here's the little hair follicle. You didn't know your hair follicles were quite so versatile, did you? Um, wound healing it's involved in, uh, making fibroblasts. You can induce hair follicles, I've shown you that. You can make this hairy skin, which I think for plastic surgeons is a real holy grail, because at the moment, the techniques we have for using cells to make new skin produce smooth skin without sweat glands or hair follicles. Uh, you can restore hematopoietic function in mice, and then, equally important, this demonstration, you can actually make all these things from a single stem cell. And this is the thing, actually, that defines a stem cell being a stem cell. That you've got to be able to show in the end that you can take an individual stem cell, one stem cell, and do all this stuff. And that's, that's one of the clearest operational definitions of what a stem cell is. So you can clonally expand single cells. You'll then get a stem cell population that can do all this stuff. And in fact, that's how stem cells were first discovered. Um, Turner and McCullough looked in bone marrow samples and they found a certain sort of cell which was able to generate more multipotent cells from a single uh, cell. And it was that colony forming unit which was the first definition of a stem cell. Okay, well it's not just um, hair follicles, these are neural crest stem cells. Um, they're found also in hair follicles. This is work by Maya Sieber Bloom uh, in the Institute. And they differentiate into slightly different cells. They're much better at turning into neurons. They can make smooth muscle um, and they can make uh, melanocytes. So this is a slightly different cell type. It's a different stem cell. It has some of the similar properties to the hair follicle stem cells, but it has a slightly different propensity to turn into different cell types. And Maya is, is using these cells to look at, for example, spinal cord injury. Um, so she's got some experiments in mice where she can show that these cells engraft in a damaged spinal cord and they improve spinal function because they're differentiating into neurons and they persist. She's also able to turn these cells into dopaminergic neurons, which is obviously offers a little bit of hope for um, Parkinson's disease. So this is, the, this is the experiment where she's put them into spinal cord um, they're engrafted, they're, they're labelled up with a green fluorescent protein. Um, this is the injury that is uh, generated before the graft, and then she's able to measure uh, electrophysiological function in these uh, rats, I think it is, and show improvement over the controls. So this is the sort of experiment that people are hoping may in the end lead to um, improved outcomes for people with paresis due to nerve injury. Here's another stem cell. This is in your gut. Um, you probably recall that the epithelium uh, in the colon is highly convoluted. It's true across the intestine, but, but particularly in the colon, these villi and crypts are very, are very deep. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about what's been done on these, on these crypts. 
This is an experiment that was done by Doug Turnbull and uh, Tom Kirkwood and others in, in Newcastle, and it's looking at the, some of the properties of the cells in these crypts. What you're seeing here is staining for cytochrome oxidase, which is an important enzyme in the mitochondrion. And what I can show you is that some of these crypts clearly stain brown for cytochrome oxidase, and others don't. So some crypts are devoid of, of cytochrome oxidase staining, and that's because the mitochondria in these crypts have lost uh, their function. They've lost their cytochrome oxidase, and in fact, these cells are glycolytic. What you can perhaps see is that, generally speaking, it's quite a lot of the crypt that's involved. And the reason for that, we know, is that actually at the base of the crypts is a stem cell population that is continually uh, producing cells which move up the crypt wall and then slough off into the, into, into the, into the colon. Um, and in fact, the colonic epithelium is, is one of the um, bits of the body that renews itself most frequently. Um, I forget quite the figures, but you're probably turning it over once a week. And if we look at a particular crypt, and this has been done with image reconstruction, um, you can see, in fact, in some crypts, it's only part of the crypt which is cytochrome oxidase deficient. And what that tells us is there's probably several stem cells down the bottom here, and one stem cell is giving rise to that particular clonal line all the way up the crypt, um, whereas these stem cells have still got cytochrome oxidase, and they're lining the rest of the wall. So this is the bad news, I think, because um, stem cells age eventually. Um, and I'll, I'll perhaps come back to that when I talk about an experiment that's been done uh, using skin stem cells. So stem cells can get old, and in fact, if you look at the crypts of older people, then many of them show the cytochrome oxidase deficiency. Their stem cells have lost their good mitochondria. Okay, some other things we're doing. This is uh, age-related macular degeneration. This is a, a project that um, Linda Laco, who works with Ral Armstrong, is, is working on, and David Steele, who's an ophthalmologist, trying to develop uh, cells that can be implanted into um, the back of the eye to improve macular degeneration, and a similar sort of project's going on uh, at Moorfields at University College in London. So there's, there's hope, actually, that this, this therapy might be one of the first therapies to actually come into um, practice, as it were. Um, but, but again, close to the home, uh, we've done some interesting work on the limbus. The, the limbus is, is this area which surrounds the, the iris. It's on the surface of the eye. Um, and it separates the transparent cornea from the opaque uh, conjunctiva. Uh, and this shows you a real eye as opposed to a schematic. So here's the limbus. And uh, in, that lim in that limbus, at the very edge of the cornea, are a ring of stem cells which replenish the corneal epithelium. Yes. Okay, so when the stem cells are damaged, this happens. So when the stem cells are damaged, the corneal epithelium can no longer be replaced. And what happens is the conjunctiva grows right over the pupil, and it's opaque. Not only is it opaque, it's also very highly vascularized. So whereas going blind in this eye, the patients also have a rather painful eye, very inflamed and sore. And in fact, that's one of the things they most complain about. So we can take um, limbal tissue from, the, from the, the healthy eye, and we can put it into a dish in the lab, and we can grow it up for about 10 days, and we get an epithelial sheet. We grow it on amniotic membrane at the bottom there. And then we take that amniotic membrane, we put it back on the bad eye, and the person can see again. And it really is as straightforward as that. So here are some uh, examples of our first eight or so patients. And this is the, the, the Snellen chart. So it's, it's obvious that most of them have seen a marked improvement in visual acuity as a consequence of this treatment. And more important, perhaps, they're pain-free now. They, they don't have that dreadful irritation and pain. And limbal stem cell injuries are something that's very easy to get if you're careless. So it's not uncommon in young builders who open bags of cement and it then... Uh, you know, the cement gets into their eye and destroys their stem cells. So this is quite an important demonstration of a stem cell therapy that apparently seems to work. Um, another example away from Newcastle is this one. Uh, this is an EasyJet story. I expect everyone has an EasyJet story, but this is not my story, but it's their story. Um, this was about replacing a trachea 
Uh, you've probably heard of it. It's a woman called Claudio Castillo. It was, she was the first person that this was done on. And she had a, she had a, a very badly deformed trachea as a consequence of a pulmonary infection. Um, and they made the cells in Bristol, at least some of them. And they wanted to get them uh, to Italy so that they could be put into the organ. And the captain of the EasyJet flight wouldn't uh, carry them on the plane once he heard they had stem cells, for whatever reason. Um, and so the st story is even better than that, because then somebody knew someone who knew someone who had an executive jet, so they showed up instead and the cells went by executive jet. Um, but this is Claudia. And this is her case. It was published in The Lancet. Um, and the point was her, her prognosis was, was very poor. Um, and of course this is a risky therapy and it's risk benefit that's really important always to, to uh, measure in experimental medicine but, but she had very little hope of any other sort of surgery that would improve her condition and so she would have had to have had a, a, a left lung resection anyway so they tried this instead um, and this is, the, this, is the, this is the bit here about the risk and benefit, and I think that's really important. So one of the themes of my talk today is, is really clinicians and how important they are in this uh, field. My view is that it'll be clinicians who bring a lot of these therapies to the clinic. That limbal stem cell work was carried out by Francisco Figueredo, who's an ophthalmologist in the department here, and it was he and Linda Laco who drove that work. Linda the scientist, Francisco the clinician. Um, actually working with their own patients. And in fact, he's now got a big uh, MRC-funded trial to, pr to provide the proof of principle that will allow that therapy to be adopted, I believe. So risk and benefit is important. This is how it was done. It looks really fancy. Um, you, they had to replace the cells inside the trachea um, which are epithelial airway cells, and they had to replace the, the cells outside the trachea, which are, which, are, um, which are cartilage cells. And so they put... Uh, epithelial cells in the, in the middle and they put cartilage cells on the outside and they rotated this. Now it's called a bioreactor but actually what it is is a perspex box and, and the way it was rotated was with a graduate student just turning the handle so it was, it was not technologically complex but as a consequence of that they, they managed to generate, this is, this is, obviously this is a cadaveric trachea so I should have said that so it's a cadaveric trachea coated on the inside and the outside with Claudia's own cells so there'd be no um, immune problems. And they were able to produce a, a trachea that was cellularized both uh, inside and out. And in fact, it was a very successful therapy. Um, and these are some of the data. So you can see that the, 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 the trachea was fully cellularized in the way that it should have been. OK, also what we have in Newcastle, again, working on the clinician theme, is, is the Arthritis Research UK Tissue Engineering Centre. It's run by Andrew McCaskey. It's got a large number of collaborators, both inside and outside Newcastle, Aberdeen, Oswestry, Street, and York. And their, their job is to improve the outcomes of um, cartilage repair in, in focal cartilage injury and, and, often, uh, and bigger uh, lesions of the cartilage uh, in the knee and the hip. And they're looking at combinations of... Uh, chondrocytes, which are the cartilage cells, but also mesenchymal stem cells, which I haven't talked about very much today, but perhaps we'll get the opportunity to talk about those uh, another time. So that's going on here in Newcastle, coordinating centre for um, stem cell therapies in uh, osteoarthritis. Um, this, is, this is the development of bone marrow transplantation. Um, started out very early days with the Tiller McCullough experiments about there being stem cells in the bone marrow. And gradually, it came to be adopted. So by the year 2000 or so, um, it was pretty common anywhere you went. Any major centre would have a, a bone marrow transplant uh, unit. And the point of this, really, the point of showing this, is that all this was developed by clinicians. The whole bone marrow transplant um, therapeutic um, infrastructure, if you like, and practice was developed by clinicians. It wasn't developed by companies. And I think this is a very important um, analogy for us to think about when we think about stem cells in a clinical context. Um, so particularly for clinicians, I think what's of interest is taking stem cells from a single patient and um, giving them back to that same patient, the so-called autologous therapy. This is a slide of Lucy Foley, this is in the audience at the front. Um, and to do that, you need to manufacture cells. And what I want to spend the last few minutes talking to you about are 
uh, our manufacturing facilities. So this, these are, this, this sits down at the Centre for Life, but we also have some at the RVI, rather smaller. And we built these in order to be able to manufacture cells that can go into patients. And this was timely because um, as, we were building, as we were building this uh, centre, the regulations around using cells as therapies became much, much stricter and fiercer. And in fact, if you don't have one of these now, then you can't put cells into patients. So this facility is now, you'll see a summary slide at the end, is, is supporting three or four clinical trials, one of them Francisco's. Anne is the key person. She's the person who runs the facility. She's had a lot of experience over the years in bone marrow transplantation, which is where her cell manufacturing expertise comes from. Uh, and the place now has an MHRA accreditation, so it can carry out uh, manufacturing. Um, if you want to use it, you should speak to them fairly early in your thoughts so that you can get a sense of what you might need to do. Um, you, you need, need to, because they have to know a little bit about what the therapy is and which rules you would have to follow and how they might be able to help you, and indeed how they might cost the manufacturer if that's what you need for your, for your trial. Um, they'll tell you about the MHRA license. IMPs, obviously, are, are, are normal drugs. Um, and then we've got ATMP approval for cellular therapies. So here are the, here are the trials that we're... We're, we're looking at at the moment, limbal stem cells. We're doing some work with John Isaacs on dendritic cell tolerization for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we've got MSCs for neuroinjection heart repair and also Andrew McCaskey's trial uh, going on in cartilage. So that's a brief introduction to the facility. Thank you very much for listening.